You mentioned Moderna um, had been working on this for some time, but the process or the the mechanism they use, I understand, had been developed by Dr. Katie many years ago, like decades before. So even before we we learned about messenger RNA very recently, this is not new. That's the point I'm trying to make because right. people are right. confused uh, about when messenger RNA started to be uh, tested in the lab and in humans. So um, I think it's a remarkable achievement that unfortunately people are not recognizing because of the, whether it's the political environment or just the historical distrust uh, between communities, particularly communities of color and um, the government, researchers and the health system. But I think we need to take a breath and really recognize the achievement uh, you've just described for us. Yes, you know, we've been, um, we've been involved in this problem really for many, many years, but especially since we've been trying to work on HIV vaccines and building trust in communities to convince people that they should volunteer to help us with HIV vaccine studies, that is a, that is a big leap of faith. To me, that's even a bigger leap of faith than to taking a vaccine that's been in hundreds of millions of people now and appears to be extremely safe and extremely effective. So yeah. we've, <clears throat> we've been at this uh, communication gap for, for many, many years and it still isn't solved. And it's, mm -hmm. it's a tragedy because now uh, there are gonna be many tragedies this winter. We have a little window of opportunity right now before the next winter season when I'm pretty certain this virus is gonna come back. Mm, it's down uh, right now because of the vaccine and because of a lot of uh, uh, work on social distancing and masks and things. But this winter, when all the conditions are right again, it's very, very likely to come back. And there are going to be about a third of us who are unvaccinated and going to be very susceptible in some pockets uh, of communities, there's a lot of unvaccinated people. And so these viruses, this virus will spread and about one or 2% of people are gonna die. But maybe even more important that people don't recognize is that maybe about 20% of people are gonna have long-term symptoms. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, about 10% end up in the hospital, one or 2% die, but 20% or so, that's one out of five people have long-term symptoms that either involve uh, taste and smell or fatigue or just uh, brain fog, all the things that can come from uh, the long-term consequences of this infection. And, and I don't think people re realize that their choice is not between a vaccine and not a vaccine. Their choice is between a vaccine and getting infected. Yeah. So you have to ask, do I want to get the virus infection and have a 20% chance of long-term symptoms and a 1% or 2% chance of dying? Or do I want to take the vaccine that's now been in hundreds of millions of people? And there's very, very rare side effects. And that, that's the choice people have to make. And we now have a window next winter. I, I don't want to be recounting all the tragedies that are going to happen if people do not get vaccinated. And so, so for me, it's really uh, painful to see. I mean, I would like to just be celebrating the vaccine success. Yeah. But the problem is 600,000 people have died here in the US and more than 4 million people have died in the world from this disease. And so it's very hard to celebrate yet until everybody gets vaccinated. Yeah, and I understand fewer than uh, you know one or two percent globally have have even received the vaccine. Is that right? Right, and it's even lower in places like the continent of Africa. I think it's less than two percent of the population has been vaccinated, and they're now having an upsurge in things. You know, the the summer season for us is their winter season. So in places, especially in Southern Africa and Botswana and Malawi and 
Mozambique you, and South Africa, it, there is a big surge right now with more virus infection. That's going to happen in our winter season uh, around November, probably. So that's what people here need to get ready for. Yeah, and I, I really hope we can get ahead of it. Um, we, we're doing some work to try and help improve vaccine acceptance, but it's a long road, uh, Barney. Uh, but I, I, I think before we go, we have to talk a little bit about messenger RNA um, to give people a clear understanding of what it is and what it isn't. Uh, before I ask a question about how it works though, there's misinformation on the, on, on the internet, <laughs> on social media uh, saying messenger RNA had never been tried in a human before coronavirus. No, Can you clarify well, that, please? <laughs> right. We've been studying nucleic acid vaccines since around 1990. And the DNA vaccines came first, but the mRNA started testing in the 2000s. In humans. In humans. Uh, not as uh, full-length messenger RNA, but as short pieces of RNA called uh, small interfering RNA that people thought might be applicable as a therapeutic. And that's where all the work on figuring out the lipid nanoparticle came. And people worked out how to protect the RNA, how to deliver the RNA back in the 2000s. Uh, Drew Weissman and Caitlin Carrico that you mentioned, uh, who worked out some things about modifying the RNA that helped it be less inflammatory. That means you can give a little higher dose without causing too many side effects. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then these companies uh, mostly focused on personalized cancer vaccines started testing mRNA about 10 or 11 years ago. And uh, in humans. In humans, yeah, right. And I have to keep emphasizing that in humans. Right. And, you know, so Moderna has done big studies on influenza. Uh, they have studies on CMV, another virus that is a problem for us. And they've done about nine or 10 different mRNA vaccine studies in humans before coronavirus showed up. And so, uh, yeah, we've been uh, working toward this moment for, I would say, 30 years. Okay. Uh, so finally, can you help us understand messenger RNA? Oh, sorry. Uh, you said nanoparticle. That reminds me. What is a nanoparticle and what is in the mRNA vaccines? Okay. Yeah. Um, a nanoparticle just refers to its size. Uh, a nanometer is one thousandth of a millimeter. Oh, no, it's one millionth of a millimeter. So a millimeter, you can imagine, you, you know how big a millimeter is. One millionth of that is a nanometer. And so these particles are very, very small. They're typically 50 to 100 nanometers across in diameter at most. And that's why we call them nanoparticles. They're, they're less than a micrometer. In, so now they're a nanometer. So it's all about size. And I know there's uh, a lot of uh, confusion about what that might mean, but it's really just about the size of the particle. And that size is important because it helps it move through your lymph and it helps it get into places in your lymph node to really make a good immune response. It has nothing to do with uh, science fiction or anything like that. It's just the size of the particle. So and it's not like the chip. Right. It's not a microchip. It's not a nanobot. It's not any of these things that come out of science fiction uh, novels. It's just the size of the particle. Okay. And what's in the particle is uh, there's four different lipids. These are fat molecules that are mixed together to coat around the mRNA. That's what protects it from being degraded before it gets into your body. And that's what helps it get into the cell. And so mRNA is something that's in every single living cell on earth. Everything, plants, animals, all of us in every cell have messenger RNA. 
That's the way our cells make proteins. That very simple little piece of a uh, string of nucleotides, which is the RNA, is how our body makes a protein. And every cell uh, uses RNA to do that. And so uh, when we gave DNA vaccines, the DNA, which is a part of what our genome is made out of, uh, Your genome is? DNA is the genome. That's our genetic material. That's our chromosomes. That's what uh, encodes the key of life of who we are. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm different from you, because my genome is different than yours. Yeah, but you're not that different. And, <laughs> and the, the amount of difference is so, so small that it's it's hard to even measure. But for DNA, it has to get all the way into your cell's nucleus. That's the central part of the cell where your DNA genome and chromosomes are. It goes in there. It doesn't go into the DNA of your cell, but it sits in there to make RNA. The RNA comes out into the cytoplasm of your cell. That's the outside part of your cell. And that's where the RNA is translated into a protein. So every three letters of the code for the nucleotides in the RNA make one amino acid that makes up the proteins. So your body knows how to interpret those letters. Those three letters at a time make up one amino acid in your protein chain. Our vaccines are basically proteins from the virus, and you want the body to see that protein ahead of time. And so mRNA is the simplest way of getting your body to make a protein. And so since it's been learned how to uh, preserve it and make it, preserve it, put it in the lipid, put it in and get it into that outside part of your cell, that is the simplest, most elemental way of making a protein. And, and that's one of the reasons we chose this, because the mRNA goes in. Within three days, it's gone. It's not even detectable. Uh, it makes its protein. The protein's there for a few days, less than a week. And then it's gone. Is and it getting what, into your DNA, Barney? No, because the RNA stays in the cytoplasm. Your DNA is in the nucleus. So, so they're in different compartments. They don't actually ever come in contact. RNA doesn't even come in contact with your DNA. So that those uh, those stories that are are present in our social media, I actually I don't know where they're coming from, but it's coming from some place that doesn't like us very much. Yes, <laughs> coming from some place that is trying to create confusion and uh, mistrust because. Uh, they are trying to harm us. Whoever is spreading those uh, ideas is trying to harm us. So mRNA goes into the outside part of your cell, makes the protein, and then it's gone. It's, it's one of the reasons we chose to use this approach for delivering our protein, because it is so simple. It's so elemental, and it's, it's there for such a short time. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is probably, you know, Historically, looking back 100 years from now, it's going to be probably considered one of the safest vaccines that's ever been uh, used. And, you know, there's hundreds, uh, more than 100,000 pregnant women in the U.S. now have taken some of these vaccines, mRNA vaccines in particular. And, and there is no evidence that there's been any harm to the women or to the babies. And, and it doesn't cause infertility. It doesn't cause infertility. Um, no, there's there's no evidence or no there's really no even plausible biological way how it could cause infertility. This is another story that is being propagated by people who don't care about us very much. Yeah. Well, Dr. Graham, thank you so much for your time. We would love to have you back um, to to get an update, and I hope your prediction of a a terrible fall and winter does not come to pass. So, uh, but I appreciate all of you, all of your work and um, your uh, friendship and and uh, scholarly um, activities over the past decade or so that I've known you anyway. So thank you again and. Uh,
Anything else you want to say before we go? I just want to thank you, Dr. Lisa, for all your work in trying to get uh, the message out and to communicate with people in a straightforward, honest, transparent way. Yeah. Okay. Well, more later. Thank you. Have a good day. All right. See you.